sewing friends. Happy Friday and happy National Embroidery Month. How many of you knew? Give me a give me a shake or a yes or a wave or thumbs up that it was na that February was National Embroidery Month. Well, my friend Don Chase and I were um, having a little chat the other day. I said, "Hey, we ought to we ought to have a little party <laughs> to celebrate." So we came up with some ideas to share some of our top. Uh, tips for uh, stitching out excellent embroidery. Now, I'll start by just telling you really quick that this show could go on for hours and hours <laughs> because this topic is really big, but we just each picked out um, six things that we're going to kind of zip through real quick. We're going to try to get this done in an hour or so. If you can stay with us for that amount of time, you are definitely going to learn some things that will absolutely help you stitch excellent embroidery. So I'm going to go ahead and bring Dawn up. Hey, Dawn. Happy Hi, Friday. Joanne. Happy Friday. Happy National Embroidery Month. Yeah. It's a great thing to celebrate, isn't it? It is. Uh, it is. Yes. We got lots of friends here. So I'm going to just bring up some names real quick. Hello, Paul. Good to have you here. And we got Dorothy from Michigan. Marianne. Hey, Marianne, you are out from Ohio. We'll sneak that one in. Yep, my fellow Buckeye friend. And uh, Jolin is here from Pennsylvania. We got Renee all the way from California. Kansas City. Yeah, Joan, I bet you're pretty proud right now. I understand that. And Audrey from Arizona. Good to have you here. I hope the sun's shining there. Send a little bit our way. We haven't had a whole lot of it. <laughs> oh, Ginny's here. Helen's here. Gail, Marjorie, Lynn, all the way from California there too. Debbie. Hey, Debbie. And Cindy King from my friend from Texas. Deborah's here from uh, Maryland. Good to see you here, Deborah. Bambi Lynn. Good to have you here, my PA friend. Pixel Girl, I haven't seen you for a little while, Pixel Girl. Good to have you here. Shirley, Shirley, you are um, a faithful friend, and I appreciate you so much being here, as well as Teresa B. Let's see. Marcia says, um, hi, Embroidery Family. Yeah, this is um, uh, definitely a show for embroidery enthusiasts, for sure. Michelle, Celeste, Janice, I'm going to pop them up really quick here. Trisha, Brenda, Julie's here, Anne's here, of course. Cindy, why now? My, we've got a lot of people here. We Renee, do. Trisha, Janice, yay, Janice, you made it. Good thing. I know it's a little bit of a, a tricky thing sometimes to figure out the right time for everybody, but uh, we try to mix it up a little bit. And uh, remember, you can always watch the replay if that is um, what's going to make it work for you. Kathy. Hey, Kathy. Good to have you here. Patricia and Darlene. Yay, Darlene. Birdie, I haven't seen you for a while either. It's been a little bit. Good to have you here. And Kathleen knew about National Embroidery Month. And let's see, Ann saw you on Sewing Machines Plus yesterday, Dawn. That was a great show. Definitely watch the replay if you didn't um, catch that live. That was um, good stuff and a lot of embroidery tips for sure. <laughs> and Gay from Florida, my friend Gay. Hey, Gay. Good to have you here. Cindy, Julie, Gia. Hey, Gia. I hope I said that right. Susan, you are almost a neighbor across the river from me. Darlene, Lori, Perry from Wisconsin. Debbie says she can stay all day. <laughs> hey, Deb. Um, uh, that's kind of funny, but um, stay tuned. I've got something planned for the future that I'll announce a little bit closer to summertime that uh, will, will definitely be a longer get together. So I've been wanting to do a pajama party, a, a sewing and embroidery pajama party for a long time. So I'm still still in the works on that. And we will we will do that one day so we can hang out together for a long time. Oh, we got so many good friends here. I wish I had time to bring every single one of you up here. 
if I missed you, it's not because I didn't want to bring your name up. So hi to everybody. Hello, hello, hello. Well, they heard you were having a party and they showed up. So absolutely. I'm glad they're here to party with all of us. <laughs> and it was a last minute invitation as well. So that's even yeah. more, that makes it even, even more exciting. So I thought I just, we'd just talk just a minute about uh, National Embroidery Month. Um, it's actually was started around 1992 from uh, what I could find out. And it was originally, let me bring it up in a, um, a bigger screen there. It was originally for commercial monogramming embroidery. So I'm sure the industry itself decided to, you know, designate a, uh, a whole month to um, embroidery. But since then, it's really kind of uh, spread and opened up to hobbyists, uh, crafters, needlework enthusiasts. I, we just, you know, embroidery enthusiasts uh, uh, encompass uh, a large range of uh, specialties and certainly uh, the things that we all individually like to do. Uh, it could certainly cross over into hand embroidery as well, right, Dawn? I mean, no no reason why not. Um, yes. I'd, I'd love to know in the chat how many of you do still do some hand embroidery in addition to embroidering on your machine. Um, Dawn, do you do any kind of handwork? I, I don't mean hand sewing, but, you know, hand yeah. embroidery. Yeah, so I used to, when I was in my early 20s, do, you know, cross stitch or uh, hand embroidery. I did used to do that. Um, but ever since I got my fancy machines, I if I can stitch it on my machine, I don't do any hand sewing as much as possible. But okay. interestingly enough, it's really popular with the younger uh, you know, the 20 somethingers, because my daughter, who's in college right now, she actually, when she was a senior in high school, opened an Etsy store and had a business where she was doing hand embroidery oh, on nice. items. And the store did really, really well. So it's really popular with a lot of the younger generation right now. Isn't that interesting? Yeah, we're getting yeah. some some good comments here. Um, I also did lots of cross stitch and needlepoint at one time, but mm -hmm. I have to say I did pretty much um, give it up when I started doing machine embroidery. But I'm starting to get like a little bit of a of a hunger for doing some hand applique embroidery. I have a couple really good friends, um, Terry and Kim, who are local friends of mine. And they're passionate about it, and uh, every once in a while I feel the need to have something to do when I'm stuck in a spot, if you know what I mean. Yeah. <laughs> and you don't have your, your machine with you. So I'm thinking about doing that. It's um, very portable. Definitely. Definitely. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Ruth says her, her mother hand embroidered. I never saw my mom hand embroider. I have a few things that my grandmother did. Um, but I think, you know, some of that just, uh, comes down in your blood too. Loves to do cross stitch and needlepoint. Pixel girl does both. Jean, um, you do hand embroidery with your granddaughter. That is so neat. Well, it's a great way to, to teach uh, youngsters to start sewing. There's so many of those really easy to use kits and cute things. And uh, I have a, a great niece right now who is in fashion school. And she, ever since she was a little girl, she was putting things together by hand, but she never did anything by machine until about three weeks before she was going to start fashion school. And then she got together with Aunt Jo <laughs> so that I could um, show her how to use a machine. And she's, she's doing, she's already doing absolutely fabulous. So, and see, Haley says she's a cross stitcher, minimal hand embroidery, just getting into machine embroidery. Wow. That is good to know. Um, if you are just getting into machine embroidery, I think you're definitely going to enjoy some of these, uh, some of these tips, but, um, National Embroidery Month is definitely, definitely um, something to celebrate. Right, Don? Yes. I, a little <laughs> birdie told me that you are going to be doing something very special um, with machine embroidery. So I'm going to see if I can bring you and it up together. And I'm going to take myself off for a minute. Why don't you tell everybody about this 
Well, so I have the opportunity and the privilege to go on what's uh, a sew and sail cruise. And so if you haven't heard about this before or haven't known about it, there are cruises that you can go on that are for um, embroidery and sewing and quilting and scan and cut and all the things. And I have the privilege of being able to go on what's called Sew and Sail 15. And if you know um, Amy Bachman, uh, she does lots of Facebook Lives. She's in Harmony, Pennsylvania. She has a quilt store and sells um, all the brands of machines. She's the one who is going with me on this cruise and we are leaving in May. So it's May 18th through the 23rd. And I will be teaching at least four classes on this cruise. Um, it's all going to be on an embroidery machine in the hoop. The machines are going to be supplied so you don't have to bring a machine. All you would have to do is pay your down deposit by Monday and you can go on the cruise and take all the classes. We'll be doing um, uh, stabilizer holders. We will be doing an in the hoop crossbody bag. We will be doing a, a hanging like that. Um, and then a uh, an ID card holder for on a lanyard. And all of these projects will start, if you've never done in the hoop embroidery, it's nothing to be scared of. This is a great opportunity to come and learn and immerse yourself in it, be around some experts. There's lots of people that are gonna be helping in the classroom as well. Um, but you'll be able to, we'll start with a beginner project and then go to intermediate and then go to an advanced project. So it, within those five days of sailing and cruising and partying and going to Bermuda, you will have the opportunity to fine tune your skills and be able to learn some new designs and new techniques and hopefully be inspired and gain confidence to do in the hoop projects. I love in the hoop projects. I started with doing applique and embroidery fonts, but I really, really love in the hoop projects because you can put something on your embroidery machine and stitch it, put the fabric down, stitch it out, and in the end you have a completed project. So it's just so gratifying and so much fun. So I hope you can join. Um, I can put the link in the comments there. Sure the deadline thing. for san uh, signing up right now is um, going to, is Monday, February fifth. So it's kind of a tight timeline, but all you have to do is have your deposit in. So if you click on that link, you can go and fill out all the information and sign up. And you can still sign up after. Um, Monday, February 5th, this is 2024. If you're watching the replay, um, you can still sign up after February 5th, Monday, 2024, but, um, you get yeah, your best right deal now, right now, don't you? Exactly. Yeah, yeah. The rates will increase after, after Sunday. So I'm um, sorry, Monday. So if you've been wanting to have an opportunity to go on a cruise and learn skills like this, this is your chance. And I'd I agree. love to meet you and hang out in person. And, you know, I haven't done, I've done cruises before, but not something like this. And I've heard, you know, that people get on there, they don't know anybody, they go by themselves and they come back with lifelong friends that they have. Absolutely. So. And I, and I had Celeste comment up there before. Hey, Celeste, good to have you here with us today. Celeste said, if you get the chance to do it, do it. I agree a hundred percent. I had the chance to uh, teach on a cruise back in 2019, and it was just really something special. And you're right about um, making friends and just, I mean, talk about a special memories. And then you come home with, you know, something already stitched and you, you, you learned a lot and you got to rub shoulders with a lot of like-minded enthusiasts. So yeah. Definitely, if you get a chance, and um, I put your link to your website down below. Um, so I'm, yeah, I know you have things right on your homepage there for anybody that wants um, more information. So don't yeah, delay. If, if Check they, it out. Uh, <laughs> forget, sorry, if they forget the link, they can go to my website and then just click on the events tab, and you scroll to May because that's when it's happening, and you can. Um, find out all the information in the links there as well. Very good. Very good. Yep. Very fun. Very fun way to uh, treat yourself to uh, celebrating uh, National Embroidery Month. And, you know, it's very affordable. I'll just, you know, just cruise wise. Um, it, I'd love to know in the chat how many of you have 
gone on a cruise, I'm sure probably a lot of you, but how many of you have already gone on a sewing cruise? How many of you want to? Let me let us know in the chat. But uh, what I was so impressed by is how how affordable cruises really are. And once you get, once you set foot on that ship, um, if you don't want to, you don't have to pay anything extra for anything and everything is there for you. So it, it just really makes things easy. The only, there's only one thing I missed when I went on the cruise ship that, that, that threw me for a little loop. I bet you nobody's going to guess this, but it was my iron. When I found out I couldn't take my iron, I started to panic because you can't <laughs> take an iron on a cruise ship. So that's when I fell in love with literally, and I've talked about this in some past blog posts. So just mention it real quick. Downy wrinkle releaser spray. And since I took a bottle of that with me and I sprayed everything and everything was as beautiful as if I ironed it. Cause I'm one of those crazies that unpacks when I get to the hotel and re irons everything that I packed in my, that I ironed before I packed in my suitcase. <laughs> but that stuff really works and uh, applicable to sewing and embroidery. If you have stubborn wrinkles in fabric, you can use it as a spray to uh, take those wrinkles out. Have you ever used it, Don? I Again? have, yes. Isn't it good yeah. stuff? It is amazing. Uh, I, someone asked about if you bring your own machines. I just really wanted to quickly say, uh, no, you do not bring your own machines. They're all provided. But I also wanted to mention that if you, um, I'm putting a link in right now okay. for a video that Amy and I did uh, on Sunday that hopefully answers all the questions that you may have. But feel free to contact me through the website or through Facebook if you have questions and hopefully I can answer them for you. Okay. Yeah. Somebody so did ask um, if you, no, that's fine. If you needed a passport, um, do you know that off the top of your head? I do not know that. I would think because we're going to Bermuda, we would be okay. I don't know. I, I honestly say that. I don't know. Well, definitely contact Dawn and um, she can find the answer out. Don't, don't, you know, don't delay on getting your, getting your questions in and, and taking care of that because you don't want to miss out on an adventure because you didn't <laughs> ask a question and get an answer. Hey, we've yep. got to say hi to our friend, Ashley. Hey, hey Ashley. Hi. Always hi. good to see you. So, um, so grateful that you're here. All right. Well, what do you say we jump right into those six tips that we had for, um, uh, how did we say it? <laughs> Making our embroidery uh, excellent, right? Yes. Stitching yes. out excellent embroidery. So, I'm going to let you go first on all of these. All right. Well, I think what I'm going to do. Um, so <clears throat> one of the things that we always hear is, you know, wear it, don't tear it. And so I kind of wanted to talk a little bit about that. Um, you know, pick the proper stabilizer for your project. One of the things that I always like to say, it's my own little quirky quote is, you know, your project is only as, as stable as your stabilizer. And you're not going to be very stable if your stabilizer is not the right one for your project. So the wear it, don't tear it thing, you know, that's a quite a, I want to say a misnomer in a way. And I'm going to switch to my mat and I'm going to show you why. So okay, if you okay. have Let something like up this, that's a knit, right? You obviously want to use a a nice cutaway for this because this is going to stretch. It has a lot of give, a lot of stretch. It stretches in all the directions. So this is a knit, right? So this follows the rule, wear it, don't tear it. Okay. But have you thought about you can wear a baseball hat? So this is something you can wear, but do you think you have to use a cutaway for this? Not necessarily because the fabric here doesn't have any stretch or any give to it. So you could get away with a tear away for this. So that's one example of where it don't tear it may not follow that rule. What about if you have canvas sneakers, right? You wear these, but do you necessarily need to have a cutaway for this? Not necessarily. I did this with some sticky backs tear away stabilizer. 
And the last example I have is what about women's knee high boots? You wear these, right? And you can embroider on them. So this I used again, a sticky tearaway stabilizer. So wear it, don't tear it. I think when we talk about that hard and fast rule, it really refers to any kind of knit, something with stretch, a t-shirt, a sweatshirt, um, any kind of lycra, leggings, polo shirts, things like that is something that if you can wear it, you don't want to use tearaway stabilizer. You want to use a cutaway stabilizer. And a lot of times what I use specifically on knits like this is I like to use a fusible poly mesh on the inside that I iron to the back of the item. And that way it is fused directly to the garment, to the item, and it's not going to stretch at all when you are um, embroidering it. And so if you go ahead and you iron the fusible mesh to the back, to the back side of it, and you put it in the hoop and you want to hoop it properly and you're kind of pulling to get it nice and drum tight, because you have that fusible on the back, you're not going to stretch and move that, uh, the threads and, and kind of distort the item in the hoop. So that's my first tip. I agree with that. Absolutely, absolutely, positively. Yep, definitely. Um, uh, stabilizer, again, is a, is a big topic and a long subject that could take quite a bit of time to talk about. Um, but uh, really, the whole idea of, of just getting that fabric so it doesn't move when it's in the hoop is going to be paramount. Absolutely. Ashley, uh, Ashley's got a great comment. Um, way to debunk the wear it, don't tear it. Absolutely. I, it drives me crazy as an educator um, when I hear blanket statements like that, that, you know, it, somebody picked up from somewhere and yeah, it could make sense on the surface. But once you dig down a little bit, you realize that there, it's, there's just a whole lot more to the story. So my little follow-up to that is something that many of my friends here um, hear me say often, and that is, it is always best to test. Now, generally what I mean by that is when I'm stitching out a design that I've never stitched before on a fabric combination that I haven't done something similar with, I'm, or I'm, you know, I've got a new design, or maybe I created the design, maybe I edited the, des the design, I'm going to do a test stitch out just to be sure um, in most cases. Now, sometimes I'll just jump in. It, it, a lot of it really depends on, do we have the opportunity to replace that item easily? If we don't, then it's certainly always best to test. Um, there's another joke that goes around and that is uh, a joke that's not so funny. There are those who test and those who wish they would have tested. <laughs> yeah, but, <we're> <laughs> um, I agree absolutely with, uh, you know, with your thoughts on stabilizer. But if you're hooping and stitching with the same or sim similar combination before you jump into your actual project, you are going to know what the end result is going to be. So I will, you know, the kind of the no brainer thing is if you're, if you're stitching on t-shirts, um, either buy one that's, you know, you don't care about, go to the thrift store or whatever, or keep one that maybe you had a glitch on and use that over and over and over again, uh, to do your, to do your testing. Cause there's no, no loss on that. But I will often, because I'm doing a lot of different garment type fabrics and, you know, garment situations that I'm, um, constructing it from scratch sometimes. So I will buy extra yardage and do my testing on that. Or I, if I'm doing something that's on a ready-made and I uh, don't have the opportunity to, you know, to test it on a, another ready-made, I will go to the fabric store and I will find a, a piece of fabric and I'll buy like a quarter of a yard and do my testing on that because then I can test all of my all of my stabilizers. You so. know, a really good idea too to uh, do if you have something specific that, you know, it's like a one of a kind that you can't really replace, like your favorite jeans. And if they're really, really expensive, one thing that I've done in the past too is I go to a thrift store like Goodwill or Salvation Army or something like that. 
and I buy something that's very similar to the to texture, feel, thickness of it. And that way, because if you only have one of the item that you're stitching on, exactly. then you know, you're going to kind of be stuck. How do you test to mimic the exact item that you're stitching on? Yes, exactly. Exactly. A little known fact, um, we have Cindy King here, who is a professional embroiderer. Uh, she has her own embroidery shop and business. Maybe somebody else does here too that I'm just not aware of. But I know Cindy will tell you, uh, as my, I have a good friend named Jan who has run a commercial business for a long time. That is precisely the reason why they don't like to do, uh, you know, an item that a customer brings in. They want to supply the item. And there's a variety of reasons for that. Number one, they already know what they're dealing with because they've stitched on something like that before. But also they have the opportunity to replace it if need be because they can purchase it and order it. It's not a, a one-off, you know, um, one in existence. So we've all had those nerve wracking experiences where we haven't really been able to test for one reason or another or test exactly. And we've had to um, just jump in and, and stitch on something. But uh, that is the benefit of experience. So keep notes. That's kind of another little side tip. But when you have glitches in your stitches, <laughs> keep <laughs> notes of that because later on, a couple of years from now, keep a little journal. Uh, you may not remember that you stitched on such and such and, and the results were such and such because you've given that item away. We've got a question here. Let's pop it up. Or um, Tracy says she doesn't follow that for applique. Yeah. Applique can be a whole different, um, different idea. Maybe we'll do a whole show on, uh, on prepping for applique embroidery. We'll have a few tips on that today, but that would be a good one for, for a follow-up. Um, Kathleen wants to know, does fusual mesh shrink? She read that it might, but she doesn't know if that's accurate information. It is a great question. Dawn, I'm going to let you have a shot at the answer to that first. So I haven't um, noticed that in my experience, and I use a lot of a lot of fusible mesh on items. Um, but you know that is exactly follows what Joanne is talking about. It could be brand specific if some of them uh, shrink. Like I mentioned, I haven't had that issue. But again, as Joanne mentioned, test. So if you get a fusible mesh, stitch it on a test stitch of fabric. Uh, you know, a test scrap of fabric and then launder it how you are going to launder it. So throw it in the washer, throw it in the dryer and see if there's bunching or if there's rippling or if there's, you know, uh, kind of shrinkage around it. That's one way to uh, tell as well. But I also, when I use a fusible mesh on the inside, I will at the very end, <clears throat> I will reheat it with my iron, the outer areas that were not stitched on. I will put a hot iron on it and then I'll pull it away from the garment and I will cut as close as I can to the stitching, about a quarter of an inch, half, a, half an inch away. And so that is no longer attached to the garment. So that's another tip that may help you with um, shrinkage. But again, I would test it and see that if, see if that happens. But I, in my experience, I haven't noticed any shrinking. Um, I'll weigh in on that a little bit. I have noticed shrinkage. Um, a lot of it depends on the heat of your iron, which is varies all over the map. Um, I used to use a particular brand of iron that uh, was so hot, unless you had it on the lowest setting, it seemed like it just roasted everything. So it can depend on your iron, but I have found... Um, cut away to, uh, to shrink up a little bit and, and pucker with some higher heat. So I'm very careful about using uh, cutaways a lot of times on, uh, on uh, knit fabrics. I mean, I'm, I'm sorry, on, um, on cotton fabrics or linen fabrics or fabrics that would require a fair amount of heat to iron the actual garment. Most of the things that we're going to use that that cutaway mesh on, whether we use fusible version or non-fusible version, uh, which mesh is a cutaway, obviously, um, most of the things we're going to use that on are going to be knits, t-shirts, sweatshirts, uh, or things that wouldn't get a lot of of hot ironing. So uh, that kind of is is you know my my feeling on that. You can also just as a little precautionary measure. You can hold your iron above it with um, some good steam 
before you actually fuse that fusible mesh in place. And that will shrink it a little bit. Most of the shrinkage, I believe, is, is coming from the fact that when that, that uh, you know, fusible is applied and the, the, um, the item is, you know, put up on a roll, it causes the, 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 the fibers to just compact a little bit. So it, again, a lot of it depends too on the size. It's just like fabric. If you're working with a small piece of fabric, you, we generally don't worry much about shrinkage because it's, it's small. There's not that much percentage there, but with bigger pieces, you can lose more. And so, you know, you may want to um, pre-wash and, and dry, you know, fabrics like that, but hope that makes, hope that makes sense. Um, let's see. Ashley says, yeah. You know, we don't like to do it, but it can save you. Absolutely. Absolutely. And Debbie says it's um, crucial, especially with gifts. Absolutely. Because, you know, again, you're, you're might be creating like a one of a kind thing. And then um, Cindy would like you to reiterate the, um, the wear it, uh, don't tear it. Can you, can you, uh, you can certainly, Cindy, you can rewind this once it's over and watch the whole spiel. <laughs> but would you summarize that just in a couple sentences? Don? So to summarize the wear it, don't tear it is if it's a knit and something that stretches, then you're going to want to use a cutaway. If it's a something like a, a baseball cap or uh, canvas sneakers or some, a denim jacket, something that's not necessarily going to shrink or doesn't have a lot of stretch to it then you can use a tear away. So essentially wear it, don't tear it, kind of corresponds with if you have a knit, anything that stretches is going to want to have a cutaway. Yep, yep, absolutely essential. Again, the whole point to all of your embroidery is to have your fabric, and we'll talk a little bit more about this when we talk about hooping, have your fabric hooped in such a way that that fabric doesn't move. Once the area that you're going to be stitching on is in the hoop, you don't want that fabric to move. And you may think it's not moving, but every time that needle is bouncing into the fabric, depending on what you're stitching, depending on your fabric, depending on how you've hooped it, it could move a little bit. And a little bit of movement can mean a lot of, of issues. So. Um, let's see, got a few more comments here. Lois. Hey, Lois. Good to have you here with us today. Lois says she has found shrinkage in her interfacing as well as mesh stabilizer. So yeah, um, even this, you know, it's something you could, you could test because there's all different brands and depending on where you bought it and who manufactured it and how it was rolled, um, you might find a variable in this. So take a six inch square of fabric and a six inch square of of whatever you're going to be working with and um, do some testing with it. It does not hurt to do some testing. And uh, Tracy says she has uh, washed her, her, her mesh. Hmm. Well, be careful with the fusible. Um, you Most fusibles I would just recommend, and I've done this with interfacing over the years, um, it's generally recommended that you just dip it in hot water because the hot water is not hot enough to to actually melt the glue, but it's hot enough to shrink whatever the fibers are and then drip it dry. So that is the best way if you do want to actually pre-shrink something. But in most cases, I found just that little bit of steam with the iron over it is, um, is uh, certainly like enough. It, it works. It works. All right. So are we only on number two already? Okay. Let's We're jump into number, number two. <laughs> All right. Uh, needles. Another one. And I should say just, um, first of all, I want to, I want to thank everybody for, for being here. If you're watching live, it's always so much fun live. It's just, it's again, it's like having a party. Um, and everybody's, everybody's here together, um, uh, having a party together. Um, but if you're watching on the replay, thank you for being here, um, on the replay as well. We are attempting to just throw out some, fun, fast tips for uh, achieving excellent embroidery, but it's, there's always lots of other um, resources and lots of other uh, topics that could be expanded on. In fact, I'm going to uh, pop a link in for the number one that we talked about, and it is a YouTube uh, show that I did for It's So Easy TV, 
where I talked about how to prevent puckers in your embroidery. And if, if you don't watch any other of my videos, which I hope you watch lots of them, um, definitely want to watch that one because I showed a whole bunch of samples and a whole bunch of techniques and a whole lot of ways to prevent puckering. And some of that is front caused by um, the whole uh, stabilizer issue. So needles, needles, another big, fat, juicy topic. <laughs> Dawn, I'm going to let you go first. You say use a 7511 ballpoint needle for applique on knits. Okay. So I have to preface this with saying I come from experience of sewing a lot on knits and my business started out as with mainly applique designs for kids so birthday shirts holidays that type of thing so my experience when i was using a needle that was a sharp point it would literally cut holes into the knit of the t-shirt and so when you have that thick heavy satin stitch around the perimeter of the applique design and constantly going in and in and out and in and out, it would literally create holes around the outside stitching of the satin stitching and therefore, you know, creating little holes cut into it. So I started using a 7511 ballpoint. So with the 75, you know, the, the, the uh, eye is going to be smaller. And then the ballpoint actually takes the fibers and it separates them. So when it goes into the item, it kind of separates them instead of cutting holes in it. So in my experience, and I know there's lots of many experienced people here with us live today that may completely disagree, but in my experience, a 7511 ballpoint, when you are doing applique on a knit, works the best in my experience. And now here's Joanne with her, her experience. <laughs> okay. So again, um, big, big topic. Let me bring, um, bring it back up here. Um, use, uh, don't skimp on quality threads, needles, or stabilizers. So again, big topic. Um, but uh, we've all been there, done that probably, been to a show or been um, sucked in online where we saw a deal on thread that was too good to pass up, we thought, until we got it and found out it wasn't so hot. <laughs> so um, we might all have our favorites. There's a lot of them out there, but I like to stick with brand names. I know you and I, Dawn, both love the uh, uh Thread by Dime, which is the exquisite thread. Got lots of it behind me over in the other side of the room there. I also use Brother Thread. I love Brother Thread. Um, both of them are polyester and both of them are super, super great quality. I tend to stitch with polyester most of the time, although I, ha I have on occasion used uh, rayon thread. Just remember your polyester embroidery thread when it's good quality, it will take up, uh, take a beating as far as um, washing, laundering. Yes, I have even bleached that thread. Your fabric will bleach out, but your thread, um, I've had in my experience, no issues with that. So if you're, you know, doing some detergent work and you're, you've got some spots or stains, I had a coffee coaster once that was stained. It was embroidered with polyester thread. I, you know, I follow the instructions on the bottle. A bleach does it does tell you on a bleach bottle how to how to use it. If you leave it more than 10 minutes, you could be in trouble and you want to use the right dilution. But I got all those stains out and had no issue um, with the thread at all. Needles, I use a wide variety of, of needles. So um, I'm going to pop a, um, an answer to a, an idea here for, for Celeste. But um, I really, um, again, use a lot of different needles for sewing and for embroidery. And I like the uh, selection that Dime has. So I just brought this up because they have all different types of needles. They have both ballpoint and sharp point in a variety of different sizes. So when I select needles, I am picking either from that Dime collection as per their recommendations 
or um, Schmidt. So I've got another couple of resources for you that I'm going to I'll pop into the chat while um, while Dawn answers the next question uh, or shows her that shows us the next tip that she has. But the one is for needles uh, across the board. And it's all about the eye and the tip. And if the eye is large enough for the thread to go through, that makes for successful stitching. If the tip is sharp for piercing fabrics that need a sharper pierce or stitching, maybe fine lettering where, you know, the needle's going in so close to where the next point that it's entering, that it, it is going to benefit from a sharp needle, then you're going to use a, a sharp needle. So, you know, the eye matches the embroidery thread, the tip matches the, the fabric or the type of, of stitching that you're doing. So I'm going to pop in um, a link here real quick. Let me copy and paste it. And I hope you'll save these and go back and, and look at these later because they really will give you more uh, detailed info. But this particular one that I'm popping in the chat right now is a video that I did with Rhonda Pierce, who is the educational um, coordinator for Schmetz. And I use a lot of Schmetz needles, both for my embroidery and for my sewing. And she's going to tell you everything you ever needed to know about embroidery in that particular um, video. As far as specifics for embroidery needles, I'm going to pop this one into the chat. And this one is a video done by my our good friends, uh, Eileen Roach and Deb Jones, who are both from Designs and Machine Embroidery. And uh, when Deb Jones says it, I listen with all ears because she has had probably more experience in the embroidery industry than um, 10 people I know all added up together. I hope to have her on my show, on my interview show one of these days, because she is utterly amazing. And she, uh, in this particular video, they talk all about all of these needles and how and when and where you would use them. So it's really, really, really a good, um, a good thing to, to um, listen to both of those. So let's see, we're going to bring up just a couple questions on that subject. Um, okay. Uh, Judy says, if a package says embroidery needles, are they ballpoint? They're not technically ballpoint. They are uh, semi, we could say semi ballpoint, which just means they're semi rounded, which means they're not sharp. And if they're not sharp, they're designed to go through virtually the vast majority of fabrics without issue. It's just that there are certain times when you will benefit from a sharp, a true sharp needle because it can slip through the fibers of that fabric more readily. However, if it's sharp and you are stitching on a knit, that's why Dawn gave you her, her tips on her, her ideas, that sharp point can very easily pierce the knit. And knits are made up of loops that are interlocked. And if that interlocking gets broken, it creates a run. Whereas woven fabrics are interlaced. And if a needle pierces anywhere within that interlacing, it is not going to damage the, the structure of, of the fabric. So that's why um, you, you pay attention to, to both of those. Kind of like that interlaced. Yeah, it's just, it's, it's, they're, they're intertwined. Yeah. They're woven together. If we could do that. Yeah. All woven. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Deborah is fabulous. Deborah is absolutely amazing. And, uh, Interesting, Janice. Yeah, you know, I have to tell you, uh, until I looked at that um, page today with, you know, all these needles on it, um, I didn't even know there was a 13 because I don't have any 13s. You know, I'm going to say really, and again, if we want to, if we had to narrow this all down, if you put me on a desert island, is it desert or deserted? I think it's both, but deserted island is probably <laughs> a more deserted more. desert island. Deserted desert island. <laughs> <laughs> and I could only take my embroidery machine with one kind of needle, I would absolutely positively take an embroidery needle. It would say embroidery and it would be a 7511 and it would be the Schmetz actually would be the one that uh, is the most um, universal. 
Um, and so I think a 7511 works for probably um, a large, large, large majority of things. But again, you know, having all of those different needle sizes, you know, dime deals with both industrial and, you know, people that are doing it for, for business purposes, maybe even on their home machines. So having them provide all of these needle types is going to give you those selections to, um, to, you know, picking what is specific for your project. And again, it kind of all goes back to it's always best to test. Okay. Uh, Cindy has a quick question here. When would you use a Microtex needle? Um, I'll, I'll have, I'll let you answer this in a second, um, Don, but I'm, I, I've used Microtex <laughs> needles a ton in sewing. I have yeah. almost never used them for embroidery. If I did, it usually was accidentally because I left the needle in and I got away with it. But Microtex needles are very, very, very fine. They are designed to pierce fabrics that are very tightly woven. That's what a micro, that kind of, you know, the characteristic of a microfiber. So if you have a needle that is not super sharp and super thin, and you, and you sew on a fabric that is actually um, my faux suede wrap here is a perfect example of what I would consider a microfiber. Um, even in the heavier version of this fabric, this is dress weight, but even in the heavier home decorator version, I always use a Microtex needle for that. So anytime I have a, a fabric that is tightly woven and I want to be able to have that needle cleanly cut through it, I will choose a Microtex needle. The reason I never use it for embroidery personally is because that needle is so fine. Our needles, you know, do a lot of hard work when we're embroidering and it would be uh, very prone to, to breakage. And because it is a fine needle, the eye is not very large. So the eye of a Microtex needle is not designed to accommodate the embroidery thread characteristics that embroidery thread needs. Hope that answers that. All right. Um, can you use sewing needles and embroidery needles interchangeably? The, the answer to that is going to be a sometimes maybe, but that's a pretty broad <laughs> answer. Um, again, I would go back. I would watch those two videos on the one from Schmetz and then the one from Dime. And the one from Schmetz is going to tell you about every needle. We had a great discussion for um, stitching on all different types of, of fabrics. And we did talk about embroidery as well. Um, sometimes you can, and again, boy, I hate, to, I hate to contradict anybody else that says something if it's working for them. So anything either one of us say today, if it's not what you're doing and what you're doing is already working, plug your ears and go for it. <laughs> you know, um, if, it, if it isn't broke, don't fix it, but you might learn something and you might want to try some new things. But I do hear people sometimes say things that I literally, and uh, Don and I were talking a little bit about this, that I literally like grit my teeth and say, no, don't say that. Because I come from a background that's very deep in education and deep in training. And I've, you know, I'm, I'm a brother ambassador. So I've been to those brother training environments where I've been able to ask the the engineers who invented the machines questions. And I'm a by the book type person. I you know, I, I follow what they say. I might bend it a little bit. I might deviate a little bit, but I really do um, like to find out what the designers intended when they, you know, recommended um, a certain thing. And uh, so I've heard somebody at one time say, just as, as an example, that this person used jeans needles for all of their embroidery, even on t-shirts. Well, that person was lucky that they never had that jeans needle pierce that knit, break that loop and cause a run. But I guarantee if you keep doing that over and over and over again, one day you're going to take that t-shirt out of the wash and you're going to look at it and you go, huh, what happened there? Well, it's, that's what happened. You used the wrong needle when you were embroidering. So it is very, very, very important. Um, Lori says she uses a Microtex needle to quilt. Yeah, now that's that's a great point because that's when you say never say never and never say always because there are those exceptions. And if you're quilting, you're doing a simple straight stitch um, for, for quilting on your embroidery machine and you are 
uh, you're going through cotton and batting and another layer of cotton, which is kind of like smooth sailing, not difficult to penetrate. So good, good, you know, good thought there, Lori, for sure. Cindy, you are very, very welcome. And Marcia says she wishes the needle companies could figure out a way to mark the needles without having to use a magnifying glass. I know, I hear you. I hear you on that. They say that if you leave it in the package, at least like on the Schmetz needles, that that magnifies it, doesn't magnify it enough for me. So, <laughs> and Shirley's embroidering on a quilt she made for her daughter. Great. Um, changing the needle, again, that could be another one of our six times 200 tips. <laughs> um, but uh, yes, if your needle is getting dull, um, it that can happen. But also if your needle is too small. So sometimes you do need to upsize your embroidery needle or in sewing as well, um, because the, the larger the needle size, the, the eye of that needle gets larger as well. And the larger the eye is just let's without getting too complicated on how a stitch forms, it's more gentle on the thread because the thread has more room to move in there without getting um, scraped. And Kathleen uses a Microtex needle with 60 weight thread for tiny lettering. Another great point. Great tips that are rolling in here from the peanut gallery here. Um, 60 weight thread is very fine. So your needle eye um, can be smaller. So definitely. Darlene says we're making her want to go change her, her needle. And Celeste uses the foam um, where the... Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, Schmetz, um, which we love that spell check, right? Um, Schmetz uh, has a really great... Oh, good for you, Dawn. Let me bring you up so you can we can see that really good. That is it. Yes. I have one. Have I used it? No. My needles are like all over the place. Shame on me. <laughs> I use it all the time. This good is how I know what, what's in my machine. I just, I had to make a habit of it. I just had to make a habit of it, but it's it's worth it. I also yeah. have an embroidery design uh, in the Hoop Project on my website where it's a little booklet. Okay. That, um, you can put your needles in as well. Oh, that's neat. Right here. That is so it, neat. So it ends up being like this. And then you have the sizes over here. So this side says embroidery and it says, you know, these are the numbers of the needle sizes. There's um, And then this is just sharp ballpoint and then this goes into universal sharp ballpoint microtech uh leather jeans and then specialty needles and then this side is sewing so the pink nice. side is sewing and then the blue side is the embroidery but this is a a quick fast easy in the hoop project that is on my website love it love it and yes um, schmetz actually has a a downloadable um, PDF that you can keep um, on hand. So yeah, good tips. And that, those, oh, those are really cute. I love it. It I comes in it. two I sizes too. So this one is perfect for like when, you know, if you're going to a quilt retreat or a quilting class or embroidery class or a cruise, you can take it with you. <laughs> Absolutely. June loves, loves, loves that. That is great. That is great. Okay, next one. What are we on? What are we on? Oh, I just really, two. really quickly wanted to say, um, someone in the comments, they are scrolling by so fast, but Schmetz does on some of their needles, they do have two different lines, one for what type and one for what size. So. Yes, yes, absolutely. Um, they have a, they have a, a newer, um, somewhat newish system. So if you have old needles um, from Schmetz, which I do, they're a little bit different. So definitely look at their at their website. Oh, um, and can I throw in another tip? Sure. Um, that I got what from watching our friend Ashley Jones is she actually takes the um, needles and she'll get a Sharpie and she'll color code them with the Sharpie, depending on what um, size they are or what oh. type of needle. So that's so it. Ashley your, Jones tip for you. Make your own color coding, um, courtesy yep. of Ashley. Thank you, Ashley. That is a great, great tip. And then Lori has one here. She says, "Do don't forget to not use the auto needle threader with um, with the the smaller needles." You're right. Um, Seventy five eleven. According to you know, I'm a I'm a brother ambassador again, so I'm using brother machines on my machine. 
In my book, it tells me not to use the automatic needle threader for anything smaller than a size 11. And I, you know what? I'm not chancing it because having to get that needle threader um, fixed um, because you made a mistake is uh, not fun. I know some of you here um, uh, agree with that. <laughs> I think I thought um, it was also uh, 65 or, or set, like you said, smaller than 75. So that would include yeah. 70 or 70, exactly. uh, 65. 75, is, 75, which is an 11 in, in our American measurement is the minimum. Yeah. And Ashley says, true story. She <laughs> marks them. Great idea. I love that idea. Thank you for sharing that. Absolutely. And then Lori's, Lori's tip was was great too. So very good. All right. So next up is um, choose the right hoop size, a small design in a small hoop. And then I'll talk about matching fabric and design. I think we can go through this one pretty quick. Yeah. So, you know, uh, if you have a design that is, you know, like this hat and you don't want to stick this is pro this is like three inches. You don't want to stick this in a 10 and a half by 16 inch hoop, right? You are going to have a lot of stabilizer that you're going to waste. You're going to have a lot of area of the hoop that is, you know, exposed and you want to have the smallest hoop that you possibly can for the design you're stitching. And it's, that's just a good rule to have because then the tighter you can hoop the item closest to the hoop, the less, less, Shifting, stretching, movement you're going to have. As Joanne mentioned earlier, every time that needle goes into the item that you're stitching on, there could be potential pulling and movement of the actual item. So when you're using a really large hoop with lots of stabilizer around a tiny design, then you're, you know, you can have lots of movement of all that stabilizer and stuff. So that one's pretty, pretty much, you know, as best you can choose the smallest hoop closest to the size of the design you're stitching. Absolutely. One of the best tips ever. Um, and that's why um, many of us are um, a little bit hoop crazy. <laughs> and what do I mean by that? We, we, you know what, if you have every size, eventually you're going to use almost every size. And if you're doing a square design, it works great in a square hoop. So I'm a big fan of purchasing um, all the extra hoops that you that you think you can really make use of. Yeah, you may not buy them all at once. You may be, you know, put those on your wish list and collect them little by little. But it, it really, the more hoops you have, the better um, off you'll be because there are times when you'll really um, will benefit from having um, having an extra an extra hoop. My thing, again, big, broad topic, but match your fabric and design. So to put it very simply, if I'm stitching a lightweight design, I'm going to work on a lightweight fabric. Can you sometimes uh, stabilize lightweight fabric so it's more like a medium weight fabric? Yes, but if I'm stitching a heavy design, I'm not going to stitch it on anything other than a heavier fabric. And I have had benefit when I've worked on either my, I'll grab a couple things here, my um, wrapped and embroidery book. I'll bring myself up here. Um, when I did my wrapped and embroidery book, uh, there's lots of different fabrics that I used. I have on the one on the cover right now. This is a rayon batik. It's very lightweight. I wanted to have a, a beautiful scrolling design and still have the drape of the cape, so to speak, so I could wrap it and wear it in a variety of different ways. So I specifically chose this style of design and I tested it, um, you know, to work on the lightweight fabric. And it's not that it couldn't maybe work on something else, but it's literally made to match. And that is the case with all of the wraps in the book. The designs were made to literally coordinate with the types of fabric that they're stitched on. Same thing with my jean jacket collection, um, my Just Jackets collection. These are, in most cases, a little bit denser designs. And they are ideal for stitching on denim. Yes, you could possibly use them on other things, but just kind of think of that. You know, most designs that you purchase are not uh, always uh, specifically coordinated. So uh, it's very helpful to know what the designer intended that to be on and then kind of um, go from there. So again, kind of a broad topic. I'm going to um, 
recommend again that that uh, video that I um, linked to earlier about preventing puckers. Preventing puckers, I will show you in that video a whole bunch of ideas and principles to follow that um, specifically talk about matching your your fabric to to your um, to your design. All right, next one. Number four, hoop properly and carefully. I'll let you take that one, Dawn. Yeah, so um, that one goes really with, along with the the one I just mentioned about, you know, choosing the smallest tube. So you want to make sure that you're, you're hooping properly. So in other words, you don't want to take this hoop here and, you know, just kind of put your stabilizer in there and it's not going to be all flat and it's going to have like gaps in it. And then you're going to tighten the screw down here and there's all this give and movement and, you know, it's not even here on the side. I didn't even catch it on the side, you know, going too fast, going, you know, trying to get a project done that you have to make sure that your stabilizer is nice and flat. The item that you're putting in there is nice and flat that you, uh, Joanne's next tip is going to go into this better, but you want to make sure that, you know, you kind of do a test with your finger. So you see all this rippling and movement of the stabilizer. That is not what you want. So hooping correctly, when you have a knit too, you want to make sure that you're not pulling it. Once you, you know, put the top hoop down and you tighten it screw, you want to make sure you're not pulling it so that you're distorting those fibers and making it, you know, if you can see the fibers going like this in, in the hoop, then it's going to cause that after you get it out of the hoop, it's going to kind of shrink up in a way because yep. it's the, the item, the, um, the shirt is going to just go back to its natural state and then that's going to cause some rippling and distortion as well. You are correct. Um, while you come back, I'll just um, kind of talk about mine real quick. Again, I show this in the preventing puckers video. Again, if you watch nothing else, watch that one. But I'm I'm talking about a standard hoop, just like you showed with standard hoop. Um, these hoops have screws that are meant to open wider and close tighter. So when we open this really wide and we separate them and put our fabric in to the, uh, you know, on top of the, the, the bottom ring, and then we add that upper ring, we've got a big gap there if we've opened it. And then what a lot of people will do is they will then go ahead and tighten this down. They, they loosened it so that they could put that fabric in there really easily. But when you tighten it down, your fabric has not been put in there firmly. So you end up having to tug from both ends. So I like to call this the two, the two hoop technique. And what I do is the first time I loosen this as much as I need to, I layer my fabric with my stabilizer, whatever that, whatever the combination that is, I put it between the two, um, the two, you know, rings of the hoop. I tighten that down. So I have done, what I've done is I have now set that gap to fit whatever thickness I have hooped my fabric um, to be. So when I'm done with that, I pop it out. The first time, I only am concerning myself about setting the gap of that screw. The next time, I will then layer my fabric again and carefully place it between the two rings, uh, taking account what I need to do for placement, keeping my fabric straight, if you use that technique where that uh, is now preset for that thickness, you will have little to no fabric that gets pulled. Try it once and watch that video. Try it once and you will see how well that actually works. All right, let's see the next. We just got a couple more to go. We're going to breeze through these and we'll be done in a few minutes. So Dawn has some ideas for coordinating threads and changing your colors. You want to give us just a little bit of info on that? Yeah. So one of the things that um, comes with most designs uh, is going to be like a, a color chart. And this will show you, you know, what steps something is. And so for this one, here's an alphabet here with a cross, perfect for Easter coming up or any kind of religious um, holiday 
that uh, you have. And but it tells you, you know, fabric placement, fabric tack down, fabric placement, fabric tack down. Now this shows you here that it is, uh, you know, turquoise letter and a yellow cross. Well, what happens if you decide you want to stitch this in green? You want to stitch the letter in green. Well, what? you know, what are you going to do? And so what this is kind of stemming from a lot of times is when you buy a design and you get a color sheet with it and you go, these are not the colors that I saw it stitched on the website. These are not the colors, you know, that coordinate here. What am I supposed to do? Well, to me, with applique, the best advice I can give you is when you're doing applique, choose your fabric first. Pick the fabrics that you want to use in that design. It doesn't have to be what I stitched it in. It doesn't have to be because a lot of times on my website, you'll see three, four, five different examples of the same exact design that are different colors. So choose, start with the fabrics that you want. And these are the fabrics you're using in the applique, not the item you're stitching on. Choose the fabric that you want. And then you're going to go ahead and you're going to pick your thread colors to correspond and coordinate with that. You're not going to, you know, choose, okay, I got this green fabric and now I'm going to stitch in a turquoise color. So this is one of the reasons why um, thread charts are not uh offered or not part of a design, a specific brand sometimes are not offered with a design because of the fact that when you go ahead and you choose your fabric, your thread colors are going to be completely different than what may be on that uh, color chart. You got it. Absolutely. Um, I got a few quick tips for uh, doing, um, you know, getting inspired by color combinations. Um, pick a pretty print. So that one is really um, kind of um, basic, but I learned that one years ago. And it, it's just that that um, whole thought has served me well. So I'll just show you really quick. Sorry, click the wrong thing there. I meant to click that there. So this, for example, was a piece of fabric that I bought and it inspired me to do the color combination on this wrap in particular. Um, when I did the book, I tried to use a variety of different colors, maybe not all colors that I would necessarily wear, although the purple I love. <laughs> I, I wear this one a lot. But I wanted to have a variety to appeal to a variety of people. And also, um, when you are photographing things, sometimes you pick colors just because you know they will photograph well. So I don't do a lot with this kind of olivey green. And I was starting to like struggle over this. Like what color embroidery do I want to do on that? Well, I got this fabric and I simply got my inspiration from here. Um, this had uh, kind of a um, apricot color and then it had brown with it. I don't normally wear any brown. So I wouldn't have thought what color would go with brown. And then it had um, green in it as well. So Lo and behold, I've got green, I've got brown, and I've got that apricot color, and it works, and it works beautifully. But I would have never thought of that particular color combination until I saw it in fabric. So go through your fabrics, go through your fabric store, and find prints that appeal to you. This would be um, yet another example. This is a um, happens to be a blouse that I'm making, but I I look at this color combination and I wouldn't have thought of using navy, aqua, hot pink, and lime green together. And yet this is what a fabric artist used, far more talent than I have for picking um, colors to go together. And this would make a beautiful thread color combination. So those are just some ideas for, you know, picking, um, picking thread colors. All right, let's see, which one are we on now? Um, let's get this one back up here. Uh, let's see. I got so many buttons I'm pushing today that I'm <laughs> pushing the wrong one. All right, so uh, are we on the last one? Are we on the last one? Uh, I think so, right? Did yeah. I, are we, okay. Um, I do have some comments too that I'm gonna bring up after this one, but this one, uh, again, is uh, very important and I know you can go through this one really quickly. Okay, so um, resizing the design, it's very important to not resize the design if at all possible. 
there are many reasons for this. So if you take a design into software, sometimes the software has a button on it that will automatically remove hidden stitches or remove stitches that are small. So let's talk about removing the hidden stitches, right? So if you take your design into a software and it says, and you have a button that's clicked and you're not aware that it's clicked, but it's checked and it says remove hidden stitches, what's going to happen to the placement stitch behind the A and the cross? What's going to happen to the tack down stitch? And then this one even has a triple bean stitch on top of the satin stitch to finish it nicely. What's going to happen to the satin stitches underneath that? So you need to be very aware of the software because it could be removing hidden stitches or overlapping stitches. So even with say like this font here, which is a floss font and it's done, you know, sometimes nine times, 11 times, 15 times in the same spot and you have remove overlapping stitches, you're going to have a lot of gapping show up in this font. So that's one point about being aware of what's in the software and resizing. Also, when you resize a design, it could adjust and, and make stitches that maybe were three millimeters long down to one and a half millimeters. And then it has another one that's even smaller underneath it and it will remove those stitches. And then the design is gonna be completely distorted. There's something that's very popular right now is the sketch stitch designs, or sometimes people call them scribble stitch, mm -hmm. you know, where it's light and airy, you can see the item that you're stitching on underneath it. And when you go ahead and you do a resizing of that, that's something that the software will go ahead and remove the um, hidden stitches. It's also a setting that can happen on a machine too. So you need to read your manual and be aware that there are settings on your machine that will also remove stitches like that too. Yeah, very, 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 very important. And it all actually goes back to our previous tip of it's always best to test. If you're changing something, now you're in a different in a different environment and you definitely... Um, should change that. So along the line of, um, again, just being uh, familiar with the brother machines, I want to back up just on, on a couple of things that, that I didn't think of initially, but one is, I'll bring myself up here really quick, um, using the color sort feature. If you have a color sort feature on your machine, uh, it's one of those things that a lot of times we play with a lot when it's brand new, and then we kind of put it in the back of our minds. But using color sort, I stitched this out in just the, the uh, colors that it came, you know, came standard for the design. This is a design from iBroidery. It's also a past design from a previous machine. And, and I always like to say, you know, what do I do if my fabric's blue? Well, I maybe I, maybe I want to use a whole set of blue thread. And in fact, that is another tip back to color because my mind always goes back to ooh, all these different things I didn't think of initially. But uh, Designs and Machine Embroidery has beautiful thread sets called Color Play. So if you do want to use a monochromatic look and uh, tone on tone, and you don't want to have to muss and fuss with picking those threads, this would be ideal for something like this, where you all, you know, you want to use all the same um, color family. So uh, I, love to, I love to get kits, kits like this. But you can see I did the blue. I did the teal, I did the pink, I did the yellow, and I just picked colors that would go with that, that color family. So there's a lot of different different ways you can do that. And then along the idea of the resizing, um, again, just for, for my brother friends out here in the in you know, our friends that are with us today, if you have that feature on your machine where you can touch the button and it's it, it recalculates the stitches. It, it's a great feature, but again, beware because the machine is very smart, but it only has so much brain power and it could at times change your design to different stitches because it says, oh, now you're taking what was a satin stitch, you're putting it in a bigger area. I need to make that into a fill stitch for you, which may or may not be what you want. So you definitely, definitely want to... Um, be careful with that. All right, let's see. Uh, was that it? 
or did I give my my last one? I don't know if I did or not. Let me bring that. I think that was, <laughs> yeah, that I think that was the last oh, one. Yeah, slow down your stitching. Um, very, very, very important. I have a little sample to show you here real quick like. So I'll bring myself back up so you can see it. This is a quilting design in the background. And if you look at that really, really close, I think it's focusing pretty good. You will see that my stitches look perfect. And those stitches are straight stitches that are stitching one straight stitch on top of another straight stitch. Sometimes it'll do that by doing a triple stitch, also known as a bean stitch. Sometimes it will do it by traveling over it again. And if you are stitching at a super high speed, the slightest little bit of movement can cause that stitch to be off just a hair. And when you're talking about a straight stitch, just a hair means it's going to show up next to the thread instead of on top of the thread. So be careful with that. You don't necessarily need to be a speed demon. Um, and uh, stitching fast doesn't always even get you there faster. Uh, we uh, look at our machine and it tells us how much time we have. If you have the opportunity to change your speed, you can change it lower and you can change it faster and see how much of a difference it makes. There are times when I will stitch faster if I really need to, or I think I can get away with it. But most of the time I'm stitching at a, a medium speed, which is about six to 800 stitches. Um, generally speaking, six to seven is uh, six to 600 to 700 is what I stick with. Just because your car has like, I don't know what, what your, uh, you know, <laughs> gauge goes up to, but <laughs> just because it goes up to 120 <laughs> or whatever, doesn't mean you should be driving that fast. <laughs> All right. I, I got, wanted I'm gonna to pop. Go ahead. Go ahead. Don. I also wanted to mention about um, the resizing of the design, you know, with most businesses I know. Um, and I, I'm not speaking for all of them. I don't know all of them, but for most of them, what I would like, they offer designs in multiple sizes. So with mine, for example, most of my designs, if it's like an applique design or an embroidery design, it'll come in a four by four to fit in these hoops, four by four, five by seven, six by 10 and eight by eight. Those are the traditional standard size hoops that you know the designs i offer come in i also have ones that go larger and some that go smaller but it's just you know that for you know overall mainly it fits in those hoops so if you have an area of a shirt say you want to do on back of a shirt you would probably choose you know the eight by eight or the six by ten design so you're not going to load the four by four design into your machine and then stretch it out to the eight by eight so you want to make sure you're choosing the correct design size for the project you're stitching on as well and that way it'll prevent you from having to do that resizing because that has already been taken into account the software that i use calculates that all of that and adds those stitches a lot of times if you take a design that is like for a four by four hoop and you're trying to make Make it for a six by 12 hoop or something you know all you're doing is taking that design and pulling it apart and it's not necessarily filling in those stitches so then you're going to have lots of gaps a lot of times the stitches will become way too long for your machine to register to be able to stitch that and then it'll skip it so you'll have blank areas so it's just going to be a hot mess and you're going to yeah. be really unhappy. And then you're going to contact me all angry and frustrated. Yeah, <laughs> and I'm just going to have to walk back with you on all the steps. So yeah, do yourself a favor and pick the design that's closest to the size that you need. And if at all possible, steer away from yeah. resizing. Yeah, it, it, it definitely. Um, and there's some, you know, designs like lace designs, um, uh, freestanding lace, you should not resize those at all. Um, because you will have you will have issues. So again, more things that we could talk about. I'm gonna um, just pop in the chat again. Somebody um, had asked um, th this particular video, the pucker proof your embroidery video, will show you hooping techniques and stabilizing um, techniques. And then I have another one I want to pop in. This one is all about um, embroidering on garments. So I'm just gonna type that in real quick. And this is another one that I did for the It's So Easy TV show. Definitely a must watch if you're embroidering, um, uh, particularly on blanks and a variety of blanks. Um, thank you, Linda, for that. Oh, there it is. Okay. 
Um, so that's in the chat. And thank you, Linda, for for your um, recommendation there. I really, really appreciate it. Um, actually, uh, we've got I got a few questions. So if you need to leave, I understand we were trying to keep this to an hour, but ha -ha, <laughs> in our dreams. Right. Um, we really appreciate everybody uh, hanging on and hanging out with us. Uh, again, if you're watching the replay, thank you. Um, we really do appreciate having you on both of our channels. Dawn has her own YouTube channel as well. Dawn, what is your, tube, uh, your YouTube channel called? Creative Appliques. Okay. And mine is Let's Go Sew with Joanne Banco. So definitely um, check out more, more videos there. But um, if you could stay around, I'm going to just bring up some of the uh, questions that we had to kind of put in the background just a little bit or some of the the comments. Okay. I don't know if we answered this one. Um, recommended. Yeah, we didn't answer this one. Don, why don't you take that one? I, you know, I, I just use my needle until my thread starts shredding or the needle breaks. So I'm not a good person to ask about <laughs> that because I just, you know, I just, when I put it on the machine, I just like to stitch and I, I, you know, I'm really good about the maintenance of cleaning out all the dust and the lint and all of that after I use the machine. But as far as changing the needles, I pretty much just keep stitching until, you know, thread shredding or um, it breaks. So, okay. And, so and that's I, I, kind of that. I know a lot of people that do that. I, I, I have kind of a broad statement on um, when in doubt, throw it out. So um, if I'm even like, you know, remotely, I'm going to, I'm going to be stitching on some delicate fabric um, or something really important. I'm not even going to chance it. I'm just going to take that needle out. I keep them in a, uh, in a little um, empty pill bottle um, that I eventually fill and throw away. I sometimes will pull one of those needles out to stitch on something kind of crummy. <laughs> or um, when I'm doing stitching through paper, I'll pick an old needle because I know it doesn't matter um, if it's a little bit dull. And um, so I kind of follow that uh, um, when in doubt, um, throw it out philosophy. Um, they say that they say, <laughs> um, the needle manufacturers generally say after about 12 solid hours of stitching, your needle is ready to be discarded. But stitching on what? Polyester, cotton, vinyl, all of those. Just remember that when you are stitching on synthetics, your needle will dull faster, whether you're sewing or embroidering. So again, you may want to follow the when in doubt um, throw it out. <laughs> Linda says, nice tips. Thank you. And Janice had said um, she um, can vouch for how well the design stitch out. Janice, I think, has both my book and the Just Jackets collection. So yes, um, I appreciate that. Shirley has the the um, the collection and is going to embroider in some jean jackets. You're going to have a ball. Um, the designs are beautiful, if I do say so myself. I've had a ball working with them. <laughs> And Shirley said, that's really beautiful. I'm sure she was referencing something we were showing. <laughs> Janice says, hooping is her least favorite thing to do. Yep, definitely watch that video. I think um, that will make it um, easier. And then uh, Celeste wanted to know, is it okay to take the sticky stabilizer, stick it to the back of your hoop, and then float your fabric on the sticky? I'll weigh in on that really quick. I would say if you're Using sticky paper in a standard hoop like this, I never do that. I always hoop the, the sticky stabilizer with a protective layer still on it, score it lightly with a pin. I have to say lightly because I had a friend in class recently. She may be watching this, and um, I forgot to use the word lightly, and she strongly <laughs> scored that and literally went right through the surface. We had to start over again. But if you lightly score it, you could peel that paper away. That way you will have no sticky on your hoop and it will it will be in there really nicely. But if, again, if you go back and you watch Dawn's video that she did for Sewing Machines Plus, and she used um, Durkee Hoops from our, our friend Brent at DurkeeHoops.com. She used special hoops that were designed to be used with sticky. Dime also has a great sticky hoop that I love. It's actually half of a hoop. It's only designed to hold sticky. And when you're using um, those, um, they work really, really, really well. So I think she got a few tips, Celeste, from some other friends for how to clean that. So that kind of um, covers that topic. And Kathleen um, 
says for woven fabric, she likes to use Pellen 101. Yep, a lot of people use that. Um, boy, I could do a whole topic on that as well because I, I've done um, live streams where I've talked about how I use a variety of stabilizers um, uh, or rather interfacings as part and parcel of my stabilization. Sometimes it's my only stabilization. Sometimes it is uh, used in combination. So that's another um, another big, big topic as well. So let's see, let me get back to the comments, see if any new ones came up here that we need to answer. Get your questions in here last minute. Um, got a lot of comments on all of the different tips. And let's see, Janie says, Janie or Janie? I'm thinking it's I'm thinking it's Janie. Um, she starts getting loops. Yes, that is a, a classic sign of your needle telling you I'm done for. <laughs> I've had enough. Yes. I'm getting loopy. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and um, why do machines allow you to resize? Great question, Ginny. Um, because it it it's okay to do it in many cases. It's just not okay to do it in all cases. So it depends on the design. Don, weigh in on this. I have something to say about that. Uh, I think the machine allows you to resize because for me, in my understanding, and Joanne's the brother ambassador here, so she can tell you, you know, the exact knowledge. But for me, I think machines allow you to resize because they're referring to the exact designs that came in the machine and came with the machine. And the machine that has those designs in it will recalculate the stitches. A design that's bought somewhere else off the interwebs or, you know, off a CD or a USB stick or from your local quilt shop, those that you pop into your machine aren't necessarily going to be recalculated correctly for the stitch type and length and density and all of that. So that's my two cents. Yeah, good thoughts. But having done it for a long time and worked on those machines and actually tested out a lot of them, um, it's going to be a yes, maybe, but not always because I have resized designs that were built into the machine using the recalculation feature and it has changed the stitches. So again, just the basic principle is that the machine is going to do the best job it can for figuring out what would make that work. And, and sometimes then what it's doing is it's um, changing those stitches to another type of stitch and maybe mixing and match that so you lose a little bit of, of symmetry. Generally speaking, it happens when you make a big increase up or a big decrease down. So if you keep it in the range of about 20, 25%, maybe push it teeny bit past that, you should be okay. But there are really a lot of, of variables. So let's see. Um, Ginger says, after a while, uh, we kind of know <laughs> when to change. Yeah, you do get really kind of uh, attuned to that. If you're hearing a little bit of a popping sound, that's also a sign that your needle tip is has gotten has gotten dull. So Tina says she'd like us to do more shows. Don, I love working with you. Um, I had this idea kind of as a last minute thing, and we, you know, kind of did a little uh, little embroidery jam session real quick and brainstormed some of this. But every time we get together and start talking, uh, the time the clock disappears, <laughs> yep. just like it did today. But I really appreciate all your expertise and all your knowledge. We all come from a different place and a different space. And that's why sometimes even maybe some of the things we talked about today maybe didn't match exactly, but they pretty well meshed. And you got an idea from each of us, um, from our different experiences and our different backgrounds um, that could help you in, in what you're doing. And I know for both of us, from my heart, um, it's all about wanting all of all of our friends here to uh, to succeed with all of their all of their stitching and make your sewing space um, a happy place. So Debbie says she could watch us all day. <laughs> Donna, you're invited to my pajama party if you can come. So I'll oh, I would love to details on on that. Yeah. I would love to be there. Yeah, thank you, Linda. All right, any parting words? 
Any parting uh, words thanks, um, yes, from you, Don? Thank you all for um, being here and for joining us today. And as Joanne said, these are tips and tricks that, uh, hey, Ivy, how are you? So good to see you. Um, thank you for being here. And like Joanne said, you know, these are things that we've tried and worked for us. So, you know, maybe we offered a little spark or an idea, or if you're struggling with something, helped you, you know, figure something out a little better. But Joanne has hundreds of videos on her channel. I have hundreds of videos on my channel. And, you know, go, go watch other um, videos that we've done. And you may find the information in there as well, if you're searching yeah. for something specific. And we're adding to it all the time. And we love, we love hearing from all of you and getting your input, your thoughts, your ideas. Um, I am inspired by all of you and I'm inspired by you as well, Dawn. But every time we get together and do this, it is just, um, you know, just a fun time yes. <laughs> for sure. So I, Absolutely. without any, you know, other questions, burning questions, you know where to get a hold of us. Um, you can get a hold of me at letsgoso.com. You can get a hold of Dawn at uh, creativeappliques.com. We welcome your questions. We welcome your your feedback. Um, please reach out and um, you know get a hold of us and keep in touch. So, without further ado, I will say goodbye to all of you. Goodbye, Dawn. Goodbye, friends. And until we meet again, I wish you a world full of pretty stitches. Bye bye. <laughs>